This is Sally Chiu from Temasek Polytechnic bringing you the seventh in the series of live webinars brought to you by the Singapore Training and Development Association, better known as STADA, together with the Centre for Transcultural Studies here at Temasek Polytechnic. Robert, the CEO of STADA, is also here with us today. Hi, Robert. Say hi, Robert. Good morning. Hi. And the theme for this morning's live webinar is Leading Through Serving, Real-Life Examples of Servant Leadership. And with us this morning, we have two very distinguished presenters. Our first presenter is Dr. Ken Keith. Dr. Ken Keith is the CEO of the Greenleaf Centre for Servant Leadership Asia, based in Singapore. He's also the President Emeritus of the Greenleaf Centre in the United States. During his career, he has been an attorney, a state government official, high-tech park developer, we're talking about the same person, YMCA executive and university president. He earned his bachelor's degree in government from the Harvard University, master's degree in philosophy and politics from the Oxford University, a law degree from the University of Hawaii, and a doctorate in education from the University of Southern California. And if that's not enough, he is also a Rhodes Scholar. He has given more than a thousand presentations in the US and eight countries in Europe and Asia. He's known throughout the world as the author of the Paradoxical Commandments, first published in 1968 as a booklet for student leaders. During the past 12 years, he published four books about commandments, including Anyway, The Paradoxical Commandments, which became a national bestseller in the US, translated into 17 languages. He is a passionate advocate of servant leadership. He's written a number of books and articles on the topic, including the case for servant leadership, servant leadership in the boardroom, questions and answers about servant leadership, and the ethical advantage of servant leadership. More than 200,000 copies of his books have been sold throughout the world. And this is our first presenter. Now about our second presenter, John Pokari. John is a serving leader and the Greater Goal Coaching Practice Director at Third Rivers, a leader development and strategy execution consultancy. Prior to joining Third River Partners, John was a senior change management and human performance executive for the global consulting firm Accenture and a human resource person at officer at the Aetna Incorporated. John is a trusted advisor to the senior executive teams in the areas of creating serving leadership building their understanding and skills to implement serving leadership practices personally with their teams and throughout their organizations, developing coaching capability, accelerating the leader's ability to engage, to equip others to execute strategic business initiatives and improve the performance and succession plan bench strength of the teams. John holds a master's degree in instructional design, development, an evaluation from the Syracuse University and a BA history from the State University, New York, Scotland. And John also serves as distinguished faculty for the Cleveland Clinic Physicians Academy. Scholar, practitioner, all rolled into one. Without taking much any more of your time, we're going to invite our very first presenter to come on. Over to you, Kent. Thank you very much, Sally. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this morning a quick overview of servant leadership, uh, how the modern servant leadership movement uh, grew, uh, and the things that servant leaders do to help their colleagues and organizations uh, to levels of high performance. So we'll put, our, put the slides up now, and we'll get ready to go. There we are. So encouraging high performance in your organization. Uh, a couple of things first about uh, the organization I work for, the Greenleaf uh, Leadership Center here. It's a nonprofit organization based in Singapore. Our mission is to inspire and equip people to live as servant leaders. And our vision is communities of practicing servant leaders who create great places to work and great communities to live in. Uh, what do we do? Well, we provide publications and workshops and conferences to promote the practice of servant leadership. Uh, our next conference will be at the Novotel Hotel Singapore Clark Key Hotel on April 22nd, 23rd, and you're all invited. If you'd like to know more, greenleafasia.org is a place to go. 
A little background on servant leadership. Uh, the principles of servant leadership are being implemented in the public, private, academic, and nonprofit sectors. Companies that have implemented servant leadership principles include many that have been on the Fortune magazine list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, and I'm thinking some of the ones that we know best in the servant leadership movement are Starbucks, Southwest Airlines, TD Industries, The Container Store, Aflac, and Sonova's Financial. Educational institutions uh, are teaching servant leadership. Uh, I estimate more than 100 colleges and universities in the United States have servant leadership uh, in their leadership uh, uh, programs in the classroom and certainly in their activities programs. Um, servant leadership is also being taught uh, in many schools here in Singapore, and we're happy to be part of that effort. The question I'd like to address this morning is, how do you encourage your fellow employees to perform at their highest possible levels? And the answer I'm going to be providing is you do it by getting beyond theories X and Y and beyond extrinsic motivation and focus instead on pro-social and intrinsic motivation. That's what servant leaders do. Well, what is servant leadership? Servant leadership is a philosophy based on the universal value of serving others, something that is respected as a fundamental human value throughout the world. Servant leadership is implemented through a series of key practices and institutional principles uh, that are well-balanced, uh, they are ethical, they are practical, and meaningful. Servant leadership is about getting results. It's about getting superior results for one's organization while making the world a better place. So this idea that servant leaders uh, focus on serving others, that's an old idea. It goes back a couple thousand years at least. It can be found in a number of traditions. But we know where the modern servant leadership movement uh, started. It started 40 years ago in the United States and it was launched by Robert K. Greenleaf. Greenleaf was a, a really interesting man. He was born and raised in Indiana in the United States. And in 1926, he joined AT&T and worked there for 38 years. Now, at the time, AT&T was the largest or one of the largest corporations in the world. They had more than a million employees. But Greenleaf um, started out at the bottom, literally. He started by digging holes for telephone poles. And over the time, he became involved in teaching and training and personnel assessment, eventually rising to the position of director of management research. That means his job was to figure out how to help the leaders and managers of the world's biggest corporation to be as effective as possible. And after 38 years of experience of that issue, he concluded that the most effective leaders were focused on serving others, serving their colleagues, serving their customers. In 1970, he launched the modern servant leadership movement with a publication of his essay, uh, his classic essay, we call it the Orange Book, the title was The Servant as Leader. And that was the essay in which he coined the words servant leader and servant leadership. That essay has been read by hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, since then, it's been translated into dozens of languages. In 1977, Greenleaf's collection of essays on servant leadership was published. It's still in print. It's selling very well. In fact, it ranks high today on the Amazon.com list of the most purchased books uh, on all topics. And a couple of years ago, Amazon.com published a list of the most purchased books on leadership and management, and that particular book by Greenleaf was number eight among all books by all, all authors. Now, in his essay, uh, Greenleaf defined the servant leader. He said, the servant leader is servant first. It starts with a desire to serve, the natural feeling that one wants to serve or to serve first. So this, this idea here is that it starts with a desire to help people, desire to make a difference. Now, there, there are many ways to help. There are many ways to make a difference. And when you see the opportunity to make a difference by serving, that's when you step up and become the servant leader. So Greenleaf says, conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That's really the opposite of the person who starts out with a desire to lead rather than a desire to serve. And that person may want to lead in order to get power or to get uh, wealth and so forth. Greenleaf says, you know, there's a real difference between those two kinds of people. And it shows itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. So this is not about being weak or servile. This is about paying attention, paying attention to other people, paying attention to what they need. So the phrase I like to use is that servant leaders identify and meet the needs of others. They identify and meet the needs of their colleagues so they can perform at their highest levels. 
they identify and meet the needs of their customers. So they'll get what they want, they'll be happy, they'll come back, they'll tell their friends, and the organization will be successful. Servant leadership starts then with this desire to serve, and that's a pro-social motivator. Servant leaders help their colleagues to grow and find meaning at work, and those are intrinsic motivators. And it's, it's combining these two, combining pro-social and intrinsic motivators that yields the high performance, and that's what we'll be exploring in the next few minutes. I said that servant leaders get beyond theory X and theory Y. Let me tell you a little more about that. Greenleaf uh, taught at a number of universities. He sought out many of the thinkers and doers of his time. For example, he was a close friend of Peter Drucker. Uh, and a friend of Douglas McGregor. Douglas McGregor figures in uh, an important way in this story. He was a professor of management at MIT and in 1960 published his classic work, The Human Side of Enterprise. And that's the book in which he described theory X and theory Y regarding assumptions about people in the workplace. Um, theory X says most people dislike work. They'll avoid it if they can. Most people must be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment to get them to work toward the achievement of organizational objectives. Now, Theory X says most people want to be directed, they want to avoid responsibility, they have little ambition, they just want to be secure. So that's Theory X. Theory Y is quite different. Uh, in Theory Y, work is as natural as play or rest. People like to work. The threat of punishment is not the only way to get people to work. People will exercise self-direction, self-control, and working toward organizational objectives when they're committed to them, when it makes sense to them, when they can see uh, where the organization is going and why it's important. In theory, why a lot of people have the capacity to exercise a relatively high degree of imagination, ingenuity, and creativity in solving organizational problems. That's good news. But, as McGregor pointed out, under the conditions of modern industrial life, the intellectual potential of most pe people is only partially utilized. Well, think about that for a moment. Under the conditions of modern industrial life, the intellectual potential of most people is only partially utilized. The potential's there, but we're not using it. So Greenleaf comes along. Uh, McGregor invited him to teach at MIT, and Greenleaf asked the next logical question. If people's potential isn't being used, why not grow people so they can make their maximum contribution? So that's how Greenleaf went further than Theory Y. He said that an organization's most fundamental business is growing people. And he incorporated that idea in his best test of a servant leader. The best test is, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? So that's getting past Theory X and Y to focus on growth. Servant leaders also get past extrinsic motivation to focus on intrinsic and pro-social motivation. I think we all know about extrinsic motivation. It's about what you have to do, not what you want to do. So people are extrinsically motivated when they do something, not because they like it, but because they need the reward or they need to avoid punishment. Uh, they do the job because they need the money, for example. Managers often uh, offer financial incentives or, or even threats of punishment to get the task done. Well, intrinsic motivation is pretty much the opposite. Intrinsic motivation is about what you want to do, not what you have to do. People are intrinsically motivated when they do something because it's fun, it's interesting, it's fulfilling, it's meaningful. So when you're intrinsically motivated, the work itself is your reward. You don't do A in order to get B. You do A because A is really interesting and you enjoy doing it. There's a lot of research on the benefits of intrinsic motivation at work, and, and much of it's been done by Dr. Kenneth W. Thomas. And here are some quotes from him. He says, studies show that the intrinsic rewards are consistently related to job satisfaction and to performance. These findings hold across types of organizations and for managers as well as workers. So job satisfaction and performance. Studies have also shown that the intrinsic rewards are related to innovativeness, commitment to the organization, and reduced stress. I think that makes sense. When, when we're doing things that are meaningful and that we enjoy doing, we feel less stress. Over 20 years, Dr. Thomas and his colleagues um, studied intrinsic motivation and they identified four intrinsic rewards at work. A sense of meaning, a sense of choice, a sense of competence, and a sense of accomplishment. 
extremely focused on growing, which can result in a sense of confidence and accomplishment, two of the items on uh, uh, Dr. Thomas's list, and he focused on the meaningfulness of the work itself. Kenneth Thomas says, a sense of meaningfulness is the opportunity you feel to pursue a worthy task purpose, that you're on a valuable mission, that your purpose matters in the larger scheme of things. That's why servant leaders get two kinds of results. First, they obtain the resources necessary to continue and, if possible, expand the work of the organization. Every organization's got to run a surplus or a profit to keep going. I mean, that's an organizational need. But servant leaders get a second kind of result. They serve their colleagues and customers and make the world a better place. And that is the organization's purpose. Professor Adam Grant of the Wharton School uh, has been doing some fascinating research, uh, including research on pro-social motivation. Now, pro-social motivation is the desire to benefit or help others to serve a greater purpose. In his research, Professor Grant studied intrinsic motivation and pro-social motivation as separate factors to see how they influence each other. One of the studies he did was on performance at a call center. Another was on the overtime performance of firemen. What he concluded is that employees display higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity when they experience pro-social and intrinsic motivations in tandem, together. So here's the, here's the equation. Pro-social motivation plus intrinsic motivation gets you higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity. So let's take a look at this. Pro-social motivation, the desire to serve, the desire to benefit or help others. This is where Greenleaf says servant leadership begins. It begins with a desire to serve. begins with this pro-social motivation. And then intrinsic motivation. Greenleaf focused on growing people and making sure that work was meaningful. You add those two together, you get those higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity. So that's how servant leaders are able to lift their colleagues and organizations to levels of high performance and productivity. So the question, how do you encourage your fellow employees to perform at their highest possible levels? The answer is by getting beyond theories X and Y, and getting beyond intrinsic motivation, and focusing instead on pro-social and intrinsic motivation. That's what servant leaders do. Now, we live in a, a really exciting time in terms of the empirical research on servant leadership, the, the impacts on the workplace, just in the last five years. Uh, some very credible, very rigorous uh, research has been conducted and published in peer-reviewed journals. And what we're learning from that research is that servant leaders build stronger, more effective teams. Uh, they create environments uh, where job performance is enhanced, commitment to the organization is enhanced, there's greater job satisfaction, there's greater desire to serve the community, uh, there is more sense of fairness in the workplace, uh, more employees give back, pitching in to get things done, that's called organizational citizenship behaviors, uh, and employees are more helping and more creative, and that certainly is a competitive advantage. We decided that uh, while we were very encouraged by research in the United States and China and other places, we wanted to know something about attitudes in Singapore. So. Uh, last year, uh, we were fortunate to have Dr. Bob Leiden lead, lead a team uh, from the University of Illinois at Chicago. They came to Singapore and uh, conducted research. Surveys were collected in person here by the two graduate students who are on the team. We uh, got surveys on site from 409 full-time employees and 78 direct supervisors in 10 organizations. Those 10 uh, consisted of four in the field of education, two in healthcare, two in training, and two nonprofit organizations. So we had the, the employees respond to questions that assess factors that are related to servant leadership and the desire for certain those servant leadership behaviors, as well as their work experiences. And then we asked supervisors to rate their employees' performance. Now this chart shows uh, two things. One, the green bars show the degree of servant leadership that employees at each of those 10 sites felt they were receiving already. The red bars, which are much higher in every case, show the desire for those servant leadership behaviors. So at all the sites, people were getting some servant leadership. They wanted much more. Here, uh, these bars show these specific factors, the seven factors that uh, were focused on in the research. Again, the green is the amount of, of these servant leadership behaviors that people believe they're getting now. The red shows the, the amount they'd like. In each case, they'd want more. 
and the ones they were most concerned about were conceptual skills, behaving ethically, and helping subordinates grow and succeed. So using the, the analysis between the supervisors and the employees, uh, the research team was able to conclude that servant leadership is significantly and positively related to subordinate positive attitudes, subordinate positive motivation, and subordinate positive work behaviors. Now, those are all good things. So it's still fairly early in the research world, but so far we know there are many practical benefits of servant leadership in the workplace, and servant leadership can work well in different cultural settings. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to further discussion and questions later on. Thank you very much. This is so helpful to know what is the servant leader, who is the servant leader, and to give us some research to back up. Now, you can get yourself comfortable for the next presenter. Please hold your questions. We will do the questions after the second presentation, but do keep your questions coming in. Over to you, John. The screen is all yours. You can hear okay. you Great, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's quite an honor to be here with everyone uh, on the webcast. And I'd like to now share with you some practical examples of implementing serving leadership across a variety of industries in the experiences that I've had. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up a conversation uh, presentation right now. And uh, this is uh, a conversation I'd like to have with you around some real life examples of implementing serving leadership in different workplace settings. Uh, first off, I'll go ahead and uh, share just a, a small amount about who Sir Third River Partners is and what we do. Uh, we are a consultancy that focuses on leadership development in the context of executing business strategy. And you can see from our uh, website here, we uh, really take a look at uh, serving leadership as a primary thing of what we do. And um, our company and my business partner, one of the uh, books that he has written, which is an international bestseller, and you may have seen it, is called The Serving Leader. And you'll notice that we have the um, title Serving Leader. We're used to talking about servant leadership, and obviously when you take an ING and put it on a word, it, it presents uh, that word or puts it into action. So we like to say that we take the concept of serving leadership, uh, we, we put servant leadership to work. And I'm going to apologize for the animation. I'm not sure why I'm not able to get uh, full animation. I'm going to have to scroll here, and I hope uh, you don't mind that. Um, in The Serving Leader, if you've read the book, and it is a, uh, it's an easy book to read, um, we have the concept of um, actions and practices of a serving leader. So the five actions that you can see, I'm going to see if I can um, do a better job at getting this to a size where you can uh, see it a little better. Um, yeah, I uh, apologize. We'll uh, do the best we can here. The actions of a serving leader are illustrated by the five major points of this uh, performance star here. Running to a great purpose, upending the pyramid, building on strengths, and raising the bar. And um, in these uh, five actions, we then have what are called practices. And the practices are illustrated with the bullet points underneath. So each one of the actions of a serving leader has specific leadership practices that are associated with it. I'm not going to read each one to you now. They're outlined in the book, and, and hopefully you'll have a chance to, uh, to get that and read it. Uh, the serving leader implementation examples I would like to share with you are from three different industries. Uh, one is healthcare, another pharmaceutical, uh, another manufacturing. And um, I'd like to take a look first off at the, at the healthcare implementation examples and these are not all of the healthcare systems that we've worked at they're just several that um, recently have embraced serving leadership and have seen nice results with it first off we're working and when we have worked for years with the number one US cardiac care integrated system we've used serving leader for a variety of different types of things there including uh, increasing employee engagement supporting reengineering projects the implementation of a, of a major initiative in the United States healthcare called Patient Center Medical Home, and also strategic planning. We worked with another hospital system, which was a Malcolm Baldridge winner, uh, and also a magnet winning hospital, which is a nursing uh, award for quality, 
worked with this system with their senior leadership team who wanted to first embrace the serving leader practices themselves and now we're working together with that team uh, they are becoming leaders as teachers and they are cascading and teaching serving leader down into other layers of the organization with their goal of using that to establish a, a high performing culture. We implement the serving leader also at a top 50 United States regional health system and this was focused specifically on nurses both clinical and perioperative nurses as a part of helping them to become more effective leaders. In the manufacturing uh, realm we have implemented serving leader at uh, both a consumer products manufacturer where uh, they were looking to define new leadership effectiveness factors and competencies that were focused on developing leaders so they could be more productive and uh, do what they were doing at higher levels of productivity and lower cost. Additionally, worked with a medical device manufacturer where their research and development managers who were individuals who did not have direct reports uh, formally but who were responsible for teams of cross-functional uh, contributors to deliver new product development results and we utilize serving leader to give them shared leadership tools in working with a cross-functional group. And then finally on the pharmaceutical uh, side we work with a global pharmaceutical manufacturer and uh, we were looking and, and they asked us to help them create shared or serving leadership practices to help them better execute their key goals. So in each one of these situations they were all unique and uh, in every one we used some aspect or some facet of our serving leader approaches. I'm going to show you one now. Um, I just wanted to be clear that this is not the only way to implement serving leader. It is a way that we have implemented it that has been helpful in different environments and we not only have done it in this one way, we've taken this way and we have utilized it in smaller, more focused aspects as well. And what you can see here is that um, if you look across the top where the arrows are, the focus is to always start off with some business goals. Uh, we don't do serving leadership in a conceptual way. We always implement it in the context of accelerating some real business goals. So the very first thing that we do here in this first box is we uh, identify business goals. What are the breakthroughs that this organization is looking for uh, to implement serving leader? Next, we'll lay a serving leader foundation where we have what we call the foundational models of serving leadership that uh, serve as a great base to move forward from. Once we've done that, we then uh, go across here, you can see on the top, we then focus on the serving leader within, serving leader for the individual focus because it's important for leaders to go on the serving leader journey themselves. This is not just um, tools and tips and techniques that they do with others. They really uh, are required to feel the concept of serving leadership themselves first and understand it personally before they share it with others. So you can see here some of the things that we focus on are accountability and putting one's values into action, understanding leadership strengths, uh, also establishing courage and confidence to implement a serving leader way of doing things because it could be quite different from what people are used to and developing a personal action plan as a serving leader so they can continue to grow. After they've had that experience themselves then we move to serving the team as you can see here and when we move into serving a team we are implementing serving leader tools and serving leader practices very practical things that they use, for example, in making decisions. There's a serving leader way to make decisions that are, is very helpful. Establishing and getting into commitments with one another. Running meetings and having dialogue. As you can see, these are the things that a team would do on a daily or a weekly basis and we infuse serving leader into the very things that they do to do their work. Uh, following some more, giving feedback and, and reviews. Uh, and also the concept of how do you build actual hope and optimism in an environment, um, not just hope that it happens, but proactively build it. Finally, once they've gone through the foundations, the serving leader within, and serving the team, the individuals who've gone through this experience then take their learnings, the tools, the practices, their experiences, and then they use those tools and experiences to create a strategy for implementing serving leadership in the rest of the organization for creating a culture of serving leadership. So it's a very powerful practice. Additionally to this uh, 
bigger way of doing serving leader that we call the serving leader experience we also have utilized serving leader uh, some of the things that you saw there in more focused ways for example establishing a change management approach using serving leader practices using serving leader practices and tools to do strategic planning to support re-engineering and lean manufacturing projects specifically to increase employee engagement and then also in group and individual coaching so these are some of the ways that we've implemented now what I'd like to do is to go back to the organizations that we implemented it and to show you what happened in the implementation of serving leadership we won't have time for me to go through each of the organizations. I would like to share with you some of the healthcare organizations and the results that they got. First off, in using Serving Leader in a change management capacity, we took a key patient healthcare initiative, Patient Center Medical Home, and it was being run in pilot. And it was something in the United States with our healthcare reform that is very, very important to be able to deliver healthcare in this way. Uh, not only to be more productive, but to receive reimbursement back from the government-run healthcare programs. And the pilot was really struggling for this organization. They weren't able to move it forward. And I was asked to come and bring Serving Leader into this pilot. And we developed a change management strategy that was uh, very successful. We were very pleased. Uh, the three pilot sites, after we used this change management strategy, were able to not only successfully implement there, but the implementation has, in a year and a half, grown now to over 20 other implementations at other family health center sites within this hospital system. Additionally, we had another system where um, we trained internal consultants and the leaders of the organization to be the ones who went then and spread serving leader to other areas of the organization. In this specific example, over 100 projects across a variety of disciplines have been positively impacted and accelerated by these internal consultants who we certified and leaders who we certified. They're the ones who are taking serving leader out and having the impact. So when I say internal consultants, I mean, for example, continuous improvement, human resources, leader development, organization development, finance, all the groups who consult to the organization. Our next uh, result that we saw, a successful result, was we used our serving leader practices to come alongside and help support and accelerate the orthopedic operating room reengineering pilot. And uh, as a result of this, the pilot was very successful and serving leader was a big part of that. They had a 30% increase in throughput, 15% increase in productivity, and a 20% increase in satisfaction. When these percentages were then put into the business plan, this is um, going to turn into a multi-million dollar uh, revenue generator for the orthopedic operating room. Also, we took serving leadership and we infused the serving leader tools into a strategic planning process and we used one of our serving leader tools to run an entire um, revisiting of a strategic plan and building a new revenue model for new services for a pathology institute of a global hospital. And this also has, uh, from the revenue model perspective, resulted in a um, million dollars plus in new revenue going into the organization. Uh, another hospital I'm currently working with, uh, the senior leadership team, as I mentioned, have been trained and we're training them as facilitators and they're the one cascading leadership into the next levels of their organization and they're committed to serving leader as the model that they want for leadership in that organization. And again, this is a Malcolm Baldridge quality award winning hospital, a magnet award winning hospital. So they are uh, very good at what they do and they're using ser uh, serving leader not only to get better they're, uh, from a situation where they're not as good, they're using it at an already good perspective to become even better. And then finally, in our last uh, result example, uh, working with nursing leaders uh, who went through our serving leader experience, when they were measured in their major metric, which um, in the United States is an, it's called the NDNQI, the National Database for Nursing Quality Indicators, the nurses were uh, compared their NDNQI scores from last year to this year. And the nurses that went through the serving leader experience had a positive increase in every single one of the metrics that they were uh, evaluated against. 
What I'd like to do now is just to spend a few minutes on um, our lessons learned in terms of the best practices. If I were to share with you what those are, they are this. Uh, first off, as I said before, Serving Leader is focused on accelerating real business goals. It's not a conceptual experience. It is not just a feel-good experience. It's being used to help business goals to happen more effectively. People will often ask, where do you start? Is it top-down, bottom-up, middle-out? And the answer to that question is yes to all three. Uh, we like to do what we call starting many small fires, where we do some top-down and some bottom-up and some middle-out. Uh, the more different places you can do it, the more effective you'll be at getting momentum with it. Our third best practice in terms of what worked was to focus on equipping equippers of others. So as I said, we trained leaders and we trained internal consultants and we co-facilitated with them so that they could spread it to others. So we are infusing the skills to them so that they can do it in their own organizations. Every client situation was unique. It all had a unique design, yet they all uh, were built off of common ingredients via our evidence-based research leading practices and tools. And then finally, the fifth is all amount of timing. And it's just realistic to understand that transformation of serving leadership, it takes time. Um, the, the larger process I showed you is a six to eight month process that people go through. And what we've seen for organizations we've worked with for years is the ones that are getting the most momentum are the ones who have dedicated years to doing this. It's not something that happens in weeks. Uh, for more information on these case studies as well as Serving Leader, you can go right to our website. This is www.thirdriver.com. You can click in directly to the Serving Leader materials. You can also go to the client stories and then view all the case studies associated with Serving Leadership. And uh, with that, uh, we are right at our 15-minute mark for uh, my presentation, and we'd like to now open it up so that uh, you can ask your questions of uh, Dr. Keith or of me. Thank you so much, Kent and John. I think you have given us a lot, a lot to think about. And thank you for staying right on time. Joining us this morning, we have a team led by Professor Hui from the National University of Singapore, the School of Medicine. I think there's a team of you, 10 of you there. And we have Erika and her team from Philippines, from Ayala. We have from Petronas as well, Long Hui Ming. We have from IBM, Jujia, and we have, let me see, Robert from Stada. We have Lucia from China. And of course, we have our own Stada student chapter, the students from the Global Connect Club. Who's ready for the first question? Say your name, who your question would be addressed to, and we go. Hi, this is uh, Prof. Uh, Hui. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John and Keith, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, this question uh, concerns uh, how uh, we can adequately or properly reward um, uh, employees. I think uh, many organizations in uh, Singapore rely uh, mainly, if not uh, exclusively, on extrinsic uh, motivators, uh, specifically uh, huge pay bonuses and uh, total performance management uh, gradings uh, at the end of the year. Uh, how, what is your advice and how can organizations like, uh, like these move away from that uh, towards uh, more intrinsic motivations and encouraging servant leadership? Kent, why don't you uh, answer first and I'll add on. I'd be happy to start with that. I think the first thing that you, first of all, thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. I think the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that uh, the extrinsic motivators are taken care of. Uh, one of the most read articles ever published in the Harvard Business Review was by Frederick Hertzberg. And he said some things are, are hygiene factors and some are intrinsic motivators. Hygiene factors are you know, pay, working conditions, relationship with your supervisor. All of those are important, but he said that those are, are sources of dissatisfaction if you don't get them right. So you've got to get them right. Uh, but then you have to move to the intrinsic to get satisfaction, uh, and that means you really have to look at uh, how people are growing, what their opportunities are, do they find the work meaningful, can you redesign the work to make it meaningful. Servant leaders are meaning makers. 
Uh, they really pay attention to this issue. They share the meaning, the impact the organization is having, the impact that individuals are having. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but if you're growing people, if you're, if you're working as a meaning maker, and if you've got, if the, if the hygiene factors are taken care of so they're not, they're not a dissatisfaction, uh, then you really are free to focus um, on lifting your colleagues and your organization to that, that greater purpose. Um, and if you don't mind, I would like to say the one thing that I like about what the serving leader folks and John is doing is the greater purpose is right at the top of their diagram. Um, it starts there. Thanks, Ken. And I'll, I'll uh, share with you some experiences of um, how it's not so much that they shifted away from money as the key motivator. Uh, however, something else started to replace that. And in several of the serving leader implementations that we've done, uh, the concept of um, recognizing that for many people, money is a temporary motivator, right? It feels good when you get a bonus or it feels good when you get that raise, but within weeks or months, at least in the United States, um, the engagement um, tends to go to lower levels. It's a very temporary um, type of fix, if you will. One of the things that uh, a few of our clients did was uh, one, and this was done, the first was done by the Cleveland Clinic, so you're talking about thousands of employees, very, very large organization. Uh, when they decided to make Serving Leader a uh, key of their, of their culture, a pillar of their culture, and it is, um, and stated explicitly like that, they put it right into the performance metrics of everyone's evaluation. Uh, the interesting thing was that drove a lot of traffic to the serving leader training courses because all of a sudden people realized that they were going to be evaluated and that evaluation would at some point have an impact on money or on career movement and they uh, became very interested in understanding what it is and starting to practice it. Another organization that we did this with, uh, we were using s serving leader in cohorts, and the cohorts were focused on executing business strategies. As I said when I was speaking, we're not doing this conceptually, we're doing it to accelerate real business results. Those leaders started to get such an intense experience, and I mean that in a positive way, from the serving leader um, cohort that they became the individuals who then management started to promote. So it was interesting, we ran two cohorts about six months each, and then all of a sudden those people were the ones who started to get promotions and career movement in the organization, and all of a sudden people were then asking, how do I get into a serving leader cohort? They started to recognize that these leaders were uh, leading in a very you know, superior way, and it really drove a lot of the motivation, not just towards money, but in getting these skills so that they became more useful to the organization and eventually could um, have more opportunities in the organization. Thank you. Thank you. I've received two questions from Long from Paternus Leadership Center. His first question is, it seems that between autocratic and participative leadership style, this, I assume he's referring to servant leadership, seems to be a more participative style. His second question, for an organization which is used to autocratic leadership style, what's the best way to transform to leading through serving? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take a, a, a cut at that question first and then pass it back over to Kent. Um, the, the concept, and, and you're correct, many organizations, and I could speak as being in the United States, and I can tell you many of our organizations are, are what the term we use is a power over a command and control kind of leadership style. And that's something that in, in this country, really they're starting to transition away from and largely because a lot of the workforce is not really identifying with that style of leadership. And many of the leaders who are coming into senior leadership positions now are, um, you know, they grew up in that kind of leadership style and they're saying, I, I don't really like that, but I don't know what else to do. Uh, so these leaders are now very open to um, serving leader or shared leadership practices. So one of the things that we like to do all the time when we're in working with organizations is to identify who are the emerging leaders, the ones who are a year or two away from senior positions in the organization, the up and coming leaders, and work with them, again, around the context of real business opportunities. It could be an issue, it could be an opportunity. And when those leaders cross-functionally start to understand and apply and practice the, uh, the serving leader way of leading, two things happen. 
they feel better about themselves as leaders, their people are more energized and engaged and get better results. And then the third thing is the real business thing that we were focusing on gets implemented. Uh, and so when then senior leadership recognizes that this style of leadership is getting results from implemented business practices and they're seeing engagement scores go up, now at this point they're much more open to um, letting that happen in the organization. I'm not going to say they're open to totally becoming new leaders, the senior leaders, and some of them are only several years away from retirement. Um, so it's not so much that they have to be the example. What we ask is that they just be supportive of the emerging leaders that are, are coming up through the organization and allowing those emerging leaders to take the serving leader practices and, and bring them to life. Ken? Yeah, I, I really like what, what you've just shared, John. Let me give you a little different angle on this, which is where I'd like to see things head uh, long term. And that is that servant leadership is not a style. Because a style of leadership is about the leader, and servant leadership is about identifying and meeting the needs of others. So the style of the leader ought to be whatever is needed in the circumstances to address what's happening. Um, if you are the captain of a ship and it is sinking, you better be autocratic and issue the orders to get everybody the lifeboats. If, on the other hand, you are the president of a university and you would like to see the general education curriculum uh, redesigned, you don't issue any orders at all. Uh, you encourage the faculty to, to design their own process of iteration, reiteration, cooperation, collaboration, and, and that's a two or three year process. So it, it, it depends on what it is the organization needs. So I would really like to see us move toward uh, focusing on the need rather than the style of the leader. I am worried about leaders who have only one style. Uh, there's that old saying that uh, someone who's a hammer thinks every problem is a nail because that's all they can do is a hammer. Uh, I look forward to the day when leaders really want to be flexible because needs change and they change with them. Mm -hmm. I would just like to add right back on to what Kent said. Um, one of the things that sometimes worries leaders about a serving leader style is to them it sounds soft or it, it makes it sound like everything has to be a democratic vote. And really, and, and Kent just put it very well, and, and we reinforce this in our decision making processes as serving leaders when we uh, train uh, serving leaders, is it's entirely appropriate at times to have an autocratic style. As Kent said, if there's an emergency, if there's a moral issue, if the team is stuck, if the team doesn't know how to move forward, it's entirely appropriate and uh, to Kent's point, I'll say it a little bit different, how we say is what serves the situation and what serves the greater goal the best. Sometimes that's taking a very autocratic style and other times it's taking a very participative style. So it really comes back down to what serves the situation, what serves the greater goal, what is the current situation and then the leader has a, a flexibility in um, either being highly directive or being highly participative. Thank you, John and Kent. Women, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Now, is there another question? Um, hi, Sally. I'm, I'm Cindy here from the NUS Yongling School of Medicine. Uh, we do have a question over here. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, do you know of any medical school that has adopted servant leadership as a guiding people for educating students? Mm -hmm. Well, I um, as I'm on faculty at the Cleveland Clinic, I'll uh, share one thing that we've been doing there, and this is uh, the Cleveland Clinic is going to be one of those examples of what I said before of um, top down, bottom up, middle out, light a lot of small fires. And what we did with the Cleveland Clinic is the uh, aspect of education that we brought it into was their um, Physicians Academy. And the uh, physicians all, uh, you know, in many hospitals, at least in the United States, are often uh, the individuals who are, who are calling the shots, so to speak, in a hospital system. This is a physician-led organization, as many are. And um, the physicians, we, we knew we wanted to get to them somehow. They weren't necessarily signing up for the, uh, the longer um, serving leader multi-month cohort, but what we did was we infused, we began to infuse serving leadership into uh, courses within the academic track for the physicians that were important to them. One of them is a course called Staff Mentoring. Staff Mentoring 
for those of you who are, are working in, in the medical field is, uh, as you know, mentoring is a very important thing for um, newer physicians and, and even experienced physicians to be able to, in a collegial way, help one another to be successful. So they have a mentoring program that they built, and what we did was we infused a serving leader-based coaching framework into their mentoring model. So they were learning coaching skills based on serving leader models and practices, and they were doing it in something that was very useful to something that they had to do on a daily or weekly basis. So the strategy there was not necessarily a serving leader curriculum that people went uh, through that was titled serving leader. Instead, what we did was identify what are they really need, what are they attending, what do they want, and let's infuse serving leader into that. And I can tell you that in um, the three years, actually four years, that this course is being run, um, it has been every single year, this course specifically, and people have pointed out the serving leader coaching piece, has been the highest rated course in the Cleveland Clinic Physicians Academy for four years running. So that's not the only way to do it. It's, it's one way that we've done it that's been successful. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. For other questions, I've just received another question from Kai Fi from the Asian Leaders Institute, Singapore. His question, is servant leadership more apparent or more suitable in a not-for-profit organization than the corporate where such organizations are mission-centric and the main purpose is serving the beneficiaries? John Ken, who would like to answer this question? Actually, um, let me start. Um, my experience with servant leadership um, is that um, we know more about servant leadership in for-profit companies than we do about nonprofits, um, and that seems kind of odd because uh, you you think about nonprofits and you think people are attracted to work there because of their desire to serve and make a difference. But Robert Greenleaf was in the business world; that was his career, and uh, some of the first organizations to pick up the servant leadership idea after he articulated it uh, were businesses. So. Um, I started my presentation by mentioning some of them that happen to be on the, the Fortune magazine list of the 100 uh, best companies to work for in America. We actually know more about that. Now, one of the things that distinguishes these companies is uh, they go with the servant leadership uh, approach, which is they care about all stakeholders. All stakeholders, not just employees, not just shareholders, not just customers, but everyone that the organization touches. And that's something that Greenlee felt strongly about. They have a very balanced approach. Uh, but they are they are successful organizations. Uh, they're profitable. Uh, they're able to re attract and retain uh, talent. Um, they're doing they're doing quite well. But it's a very balanced approach. We actually know less about a nonprofit. So we know about some that have a very top down authoritarian leadership and some that that are servant led. Uh, we know uh, admirals and generals in the military in the United States who promote servant leadership um, and through informal organizations. So. Uh, we find it everywhere. Uh, we just happen to know more about private businesses. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that because I have had the opportunity to implement serving leadership in both the nonprofit and the for-profit commercial uh, setting, and I will agree with what Kent said. Um, we see it much more in the for-profit world. The interesting thing is uh, people assume when they first hear about serving leadership, and I'll confess I assumed the same thing earlier years ago when I first um, started to understand it, that it's soft, that it's touchy-feely for lack of a better term, that it isn't rigorous. And it's quite different and you'll see in, in one of the um, actions of a serving leader as we define them, you know, we talk about raising the bar for really setting high standards. When I did this work in a nonprofit setting, it was very, very helpful to a variety of companies. I probably did it with about 15 different companies because it gave them tools that they were able to execute more effectively as a business because of the concept of the rigor of getting real results. If you remember what I said, you know, we don't just use serving leadership in a conceptual way. We use it to execute real business strategies. And when they learned how to use these tools and practices uh, to execute the strategies that they had in the nonprofits, they started to perform better and it was, it was very helpful to them. So we've seen it be successful on both sides, um, and as Ken said, surprisingly, probably more so in the commercial world than in the nonprofit world. Thank you. Now, I wonder if Ayala from Philippines or the student chapter from Global Connect Club, do you have any questions? I see a hand. Yes. 
Please say your name and your question quickly. Go ahead. You need to unmute, unmute first. Um, hi. Hi, uh, okay. Um, as student leaders, uh, youths like me grow up with ex high extrinsic motivation. For example, most youths in school participate in uh, co-curricular activities to gain CCA points. Um, how do you think we can get other youths to be more uh, self-motivated and serve um, not because of rewards? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Go ahead, Kent, why don't you start? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't think we can motivate anybody, but we can create an environment in which we can draw out their own motivation. Um, you know, I, I think the challenge is to is to talk to people about what's really meaningful. Um, uh, you know, what's meaningful to them in their life? Uh, what do they enjoy doing? Uh, see if you can find out what their interests are, and see if there's a way to to draw that in and and match that up so that they can pursue uh, their interests and their meaning, their intrinsic motivation uh, by doing things on campus and then later in life. I don't think this is easy. It requires uh, a lot of listening. Robert Greenleaf said that. Listening is the premier skill of the servant leader. That's where it begins. Um, and this is not a, a new issue. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I started uh, trying to address this issue um, more than 40 years ago when I was a, a student in college trying to draw out students in high school. Um, the basic idea is listen, try to figure out what they're already interested in, see if you can build on that and, and uh, connect with that in a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that, I've had the opportunity, um, as Ken has, to be doing this in high schools, and my son is a high school student, and whether he likes it or not, his dad does leadership there for him in his school doing leadership <laughs> with, uh, with him and his friends. And interesting thing is I'm taking Serving Leader tomorrow uh, morning. Uh, it's evening for me uh, here in the United States. It's, um, it's at 10 o'clock in the evening on Thursday night, and tomorrow morning I am um, working with the faculty of this high school and starting to infuse serving leadership there. But I'll get back to the students. Uh, one of the things that has always impressed me, um, inspired me about you know, younger individuals coming into their own is they are looking for a cause. And I always ask a question, all things equal around pay or benefits, um, would you rather join a company or join a cause? And, and many of you are probably realizing the answer for most people, especially for younger folks, is join a cause because it has meaning. It, it has a motivation that goes beyond just going to a job every day. Um, so to Kent's point, really being very specific about creating the great purpose. And as you challenge leaders around you, uh, I might recommend that you do something that I challenge leaders with is this. You have a choice. You always have a choice. And one choice is you can copy the leadership styles that are not motivating to you, uh, do not lead to high engagement, or you can choose to understand and learn and practice a leadership style that will do the following. It will connect you to individuals at a deeper level, and I think everyone recognizes that when individuals connect as human beings, there is a, a, a desire to help one another in a stronger way. It will increase hope, it will increase confidence, it will increase optimism in organizations. Now, the reason I said those three things and why they're so important, uh, according to research by the Gallup organization, hope, optimism, confidence, and presence, which I discussed first, are the building blocks of employee engagement. So when you practice serving leadership um, ways of being, not and as Ken said, it's not just a technique, it's a way of being. Um, it's a way of showing up for other people that will increase those things of presence, hope, optimism, and confidence, which will then make you a leader that other people are attracted to. And then together, you can then go and you can conquer a cause versus going to a job every day. Uh, so those are some of the things that I would say tend to work um, and, and tend to get people engaged and enthused and excited about serving leadership. Thank you. We have time just for one question. I'm not sure if Ayala, IBM, NUS. Ayala, you on? 
Uh, hi. We can hear you. Your question, Ayala? Yes. Um, servant leadership can be such a conceptual. Well, it can be a big concept. Um, can the speakers give us more concrete examples of how the individual could practice um, servant leadership in daily life at work? Let me just uh, start quickly and say that um, you're right. For, for many years, the servant leadership movement has talked about who the servant leader is rather than what the servant leader does. And of course, who the servant leader is is really important. What are your values, characteristics, and so on? Uh, we're spending a lot more time now in response to, to questions like yours focused on uh, key practices and institutional principles, what servant leaders do. And of course, that's what John has been talking about and what he does when he goes into an organization. It's about implementation. In terms of individuals, there are key things that, that individuals, uh, servant leaders do. Uh, they, they try to become aware of the impact they're having on others, so self-awareness. Uh, they, they try to become much better listeners. Um, they try to listen um, sideways up, down, and outside of the organization to, to all, all parties. Um, they, they coach and development, develop and, and, and mentor uh, people so that they grow. Um, there, there are very specific things they do that help them to be effective. Um, some of those uh, skills we are listed, for example, on the Greenleaf Asia website. I encourage you to go there. But yes, there, there is more and more information and more and more practice in that area, and that's, I'm very encouraged by that. I'm going to add three quick things, and, and it's not, not only that there are only three. Um, three that I would say if you wanted to start to do something very soon that would really make a difference. And uh, when I say make a difference, I mean it's not so much just about quick tips and techniques or tricks. Um, those tend to have very um, non-sustainable life cycles to them, and then people feel manipulated sometimes when you come and you're just trying some new trick on them. Uh, so here's what I would recommend are three things that you can just show up and, and be differently around people, and, and they're these three things. First off, really be focused on what is the greater goal? What really matters most? What are we doing and why are we doing that? Not only being focused on that yourself, but being able to share that with other people and constantly remind individuals what is the bigger purpose, what's the greater goal, what's our great purpose for why we're doing what we're doing. And I mentioned before what is the cause as opposed to just coming to a company every day or an organization wherever you are. The second thing that I would recommend is what we call compassionate presence or being in an IU relationship with someone where you're stopping to take the time as Ken said to truly listen to them in a way where the other individual feels that their concerns, their ideas, um, their experiences are valued by you and they're of equal importance as your ideas and experiences and concerns. And then the third thing that I would recommend is a serving leader does a great job at recognizing where there are assets and strengths in other people and building those people up, recognizing what they do well and asking them to do more of what they do well. One of the pharmaceutical company that we worked with and actually um, the, the crowd that we were working with was in Asia, we introduced a very simple term that we almost did accidentally and we asked leaders to go around and see where people's strengths were, see what they were doing well, where they were already having success, and ask them, please do more of that. That thing that you're doing so well, do that more, do more of that. And we had this phrase that said, do more of that. And when we came back uh, months later, just that simple phrase had really done so much to um, accelerate innovation, uh, I don't want to say it was a magical thing that solved all the problems. It didn't. It just helped them really get into a place where people felt good because the leader was seeing what they were doing well and not just pointing out the deficits or what they weren't doing well. So again, the three things, be very focused on what the great purpose is not, and not only remind yourself but tell other people. Um, secondly, be in an IU relationship with other people. Validate and value them. As, as an equal to you, regardless if you report to them, if they're above you or peers. And then the third thing, look for opportunities where you can tell people, do more of that. Take that strength that you have and do it more because it's great. Thank you so much. I'm going to just ask Robert to say something before I close about post-live webinar follow-up. Robert, CEO of Stada, can you help us with post-webinar follow-up? 
Um, actually, uh, Sally, I just have a comment on serving uh, leadership, uh, serving leaders, actually. Uh, actually, in my mind, if you were to look at and listen to John and Kent, um, they are actually talking about the three L's in, in that sense. Uh, when you're talking about trying to motivate someone or, or showing that you care for someone, you're actually working towards uh, this, this word called love. You're loving them at the same time. Uh, because people feel love and care for, they will return that love and care. Uh, and as you do that, as you are going through that action of knowing more about them, you're actually learning about them too. So they are learning about your, your leadership style, you are learning about their, their style as well. So that is this binding together, which is really team building in that sense. And, and of course, lastly, being, being the leader who, who cares and learn and want to learn about people, and in, in, in the end, people are also learning about your style, you are in some way leading them. So actually, to me, uh, the serving leader is about these three L's of you know, uh, uh, learning, lead, uh, loving, learning, and leading. So uh, that, that, that's my input uh, on that, that for, for the students as well. Thank you, Robert. We want to really thank Ken and John for so generously spending time with us this morning and sharing with us so many precious things. For all the viewers out there, thank you so much for participating in this live webinar today. This video will be uploaded on the Stada's YouTube account for your viewing. Please just search Stada and you will find the video. LinkedIn users, you can view this on the group chat called Community Spirit. And with that, just to close, I hope that each night when you see the stars, you will remember the star model. Live for the greater purpose. To, to quote what Ken say, resolve to be a meaning maker. And as John says, Servant leadership is beyond feeling good. It is all about doing good. May you all be committed to a greater purpose. May you be all committed to start with yourself. Because servant leadership begins with the being of who you are, leading from where you are, from the inside out. And it is from there that servant leadership becomes beyond a philosophy, but a practice. It's not a soft concept, but really concrete implementable principles and practice that brings results and high performing organization. With that, this is Sally Chiu signing off from the Google Connect Village. So the next two months, we see you again and thank you for being a part of this community. Good day and good night, John. Good night.